No, Zatty, way, way off. I don't see a summon dwarf spell in here anywhere. Matter of fact, are we in the right edition? Oh, uh, hey, oh, the bard here, and I see my camera's on, and that means it's time for another cracking unboxing and review of a figure. And today we are delving into my very favourite mythological character, Medusa. Only not this one, because we are once more in the realm of huge boxes way too big to fit in this frame. So, let's waste no time. Come on, Zaddy, we've got to make some room. Now, where's your hat? Where's your hand? Looking sharp. Yo-ho, my friends. We find ourselves once more beset by a giant box, and this one contains Medusa. But not ordinary. Well, there is no ordinary Medusa, really. Matter of fact, it's heavy metal Medusa. Now this statue is made by the Hollywood Collectors Group and they do a whole series of statues based on the cover girls of Heavy Metal Magazine but this is the only one I thought was any good. Our Medusa statue perfectly captures the essence of the incredible original artwork created by Simon Bisley for the cover of Heavy Metal Magazine. Museum quality and hand painted to the finest detail. Uh, we'll see about that. Well, I'm very interested in seeing if it really does capture the essence of the artwork, but I'm also very interested in how it reflects on the mythological figure of Medusa. But what do you really know until you've opened it up? Well, not a lot. So let's do that right now. And again, I don't need the knife for the first part. This is very much like Conan. I am very interested to see how this stacks up in quality to Conan. It is a different company after all, and it's always interesting to see. Landed on the rhino, and I assure you that my sisters of battle are perfectly safe. QC passed. Good to know the Queen's Council approves. Keep an eye on this, Conan. Oh, giant nest of vipers. There we are. That's all there is to it. She's just in two pieces? Well, this is going to be easy. Right, with the giant box out of the way, we can return to normal frame. You know, it's kind of appropriate that when we open it up, Medusa should be facing away from us. It's probably a safety measure. Right, two giant pieces, eh? All right. Well, here's the base. Let's have a look at what's underneath. Oh, man, it's heavy. Edition number 89 of 600. That's a good omen. 89 was a good year. That's when the second edition of Dungeons and Dragons came out. The best edition. Heavy Metal is a registered trademark of Metal Mammoth Incorporated. Metal Mammoth. It really is a large and heavy base. I like that it's got some nice colour on it, purple and bright here. Wizards all teleported in at once and got stuck in the same rock. And Medusa just happened to be there. If I came upon such a scene, I'd pose for a photo too. Or for a sculptor, or whatever. Or a painter, because this is, of course, an adaptation of Simon Bisley's cover for Heavy Metal magazine, which I don't have a copy of. I, I didn't collect the magazine, I'm sorry to say. How do you come out of there, Medusa? Come on. Not so bad. All one bit. No magnets. Come on. Of course the prongs don't line up. There we go. Steady. Okay. It's okay. It's good. Once it's in there, it's in there. The bottom of the base would have been a really clever place to put a Gorgonian. Or a Gorgonian, as I like to call them. Right, well I'm off to take a couple of picky wickies, and when I come back, we'll have a closer look. Although, uh, we might not look too close, you know what I mean. Medusa, Medusa, Medusa. Is there any mythological figure as well known and far-reaching as Medusa? She's like a mythological Mickey Mouse. Well, okay, maybe Hercules is Mickey Mouse, but Medusa is definitely Donald Duck, which is appropriate because he's the best and most interesting one. Yeah, whatever. When I was a lad before I'd ever even heard the name Medusa, I had already encountered her in the form of the Diamond Ray. But that makes those who see it. I know what it does, Furface. She's a really tremendous symbol of power, of fear and danger and ambiguity, metamorphosis, transhumanism, the list goes on potentially forever. She is the best sex symbol in the galaxy, and she was a good friend. You know, Medusa has really come to symbolise forbidden desire and the classic human flaw of fatal curiosity in a much more personal and intimate way than, say, the Sirens or Pandora do. And this was what makes her a really great subject for a pin-up sort of an image. And uh, quite a subversive one at that. You see, where the pin-up genre, and the erotica in general, frankly, tend to foreground the body as the main feature, Medusa, even when she's being drawn by Bisley, 
makes it all about the head. Andromeda by Perseus saved and wed, hankered each day to see the Gorgon's head, till o'er a fount he held it, bade her lean, and mirrored in the wave was safely seen that death she lived by. So reads my favourite Medusa poem by Dante Gabriel Rossetti. It's a really wonderful representation of the allure and the incredible mystique of the Gorgon's head as poor Andromeda is tormented by her inability to see and experience this forbidden thing. It also highlights the dangerous and threatening undercurrent as Perseus puts himself and Andromeda both at great risk in an effort to slake her desire. But of course, all she can see is an image, a mere reflection. It's all bound up with what I like to call the rule of the Gorgon, and you know it already. If you see it, you are destroyed. It's a concept so simple and fascinating and resonant that it comes back to us again and again. After all, how often have we seen it reproduced and evoked and paralleled and co-opted? Good Lord, even my favourite ghost does something similar. <laughs> Oh, of course I'm going to be interested in a huge, figury statue of Medusa. Matter of fact, I'm amazed I don't have one already, but this one is especially interesting because it's based on a cracking image by Simon Bisley, whose work I have much admired in the pages of 2000 AD, uh, here especially. So, any good? Well, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to give you a very straight answer. So there's no getting around it, this is a highly flawed statue. But as a bit of a Gorgonologist, I still found it enormously interesting. And I'm going to try and show you why. Right, before we go any further, let's take a look at Simon Bisley's image. The statue is a really fascinating example of an adaptation. So it's going to be really useful to take a look at the image on which it was based. Ah, a fine picture it is. It's very erotic, certainly, but not because of Medusa's body. Not in the way you might expect, anyway. So that's the trick of these things sometimes. Erotic does not automatically mean sexy. Medusa's eroticised body, even with all of its busily extremes, is not really where the erotics of the image lie. Now, it has a very important job, mind you. It has a function in putting sex at the forefront of the observer's imagination, so that when your eye comes to this great dark pillar behind her, or these figures that are arrayed around her, you have almost no choice but to read them in purely sexual terms. We'll look at that more closely a little later on, but for now it's worth understanding that Medusa's body confirms the image's sexual theme while the head places it firmly under the rule of the Gorgon. So, the statue. Right, where to start? Well, where else but Medusa's crowning physical attribute, her snaky hair. One of Ovid's innovations. Bisley's snakes look great. Yeah, look at them there, full of character and expression of the danger that Medusa represents. Surely the statue treats this signature characteristic with exactly as much care. Ah, uh, well, uh, no. Well, this is terrible. All these problems are clustered together in one of the major focal points, and once you've noticed, they'll jump right out at you, every time. But at the same time, thanks to my Medusa bias, something interesting jumps out at me. Some fascinating clues as to exactly what kind of Medusa we're looking at. Now this is where it gets interesting, because there are loads of different depictions of Gorgons in general, and Medusa in particular. Variations, parallels, derivations, both ancient and modern, and I find them all fascinating. Even the really marginal stuff. And do so, so what kind of Medusa is this? Well, as a practiced observer of Gorgons, I can tell you. Going by her face, snaky hair, and scalp, which is visible on the statue, funnily enough, I can declare this a modern version of a stage three Ovidian Medusa, or beautiful Ovidian for short. What does that mean? It means that she's beautiful, and that she's cursed. You see, the third stage of Gorgonic development in ancient art is when the Gorgon first started to be depicted as beautiful. Meanwhile, Ovid, cracking Roman poet, came up with the idea of snakes for hair. But that's not the whole reason I use the term Ovidian. Ovid deals with Medusa in his masterwork, The Metamorphosis, which features the variant of Medusa lore in which she was not born into hideous monsterhood, but was transformed from a state of great beauty. 
Well, this Medusa obviously isn't hideous, so why do I think she's cursed? Well, the answer is all in the hair. Or snakes, or whatever. Nest of vipers. Look at the way these snakes just jut weirdly up from her scalp. It looks really unnatural. Now, that's a solid indicator that this Medusa wasn't born into Gorgonhood, but the real clincher is round the back. Here we see her hands clasped around two of the snakes, grappling with them as if they're not really part of her body, and they don't answer to her will. It adds a new layer of interest to this sensual pose. It makes it clear that beneath this seductive veneer, this Medusa is struggling with what she's become. It's a major show of creativity, and it's way more important, I think, than figuring out what the back of her weird unitard thing looks like. Now, the hands might not be all that well painted, and the snakes, eh, well, they're a little bit subdued. But this introduces a new idea, new meaning to the image, and that's what adaptation is all about. Right, I've consulted with the ancient Greeks on the ideal physique, and apparently it's this. We should all strive for it, even if it involves ageing a few years, but that's all right. The figures in Bisley's image capture the gorgonic ambiguity between desire and dread very well, I think. They seem to oscillate between agony and orgasm, pleasure and shame, horror and a deepening experience of the sublime. Look at this one, cowering away from Medusa's sex. But it's too late. He's looked, he's seen the Gorgon and is locked with the others in their strange post-human becoming, seeming to melt into that giant phallus back there, eternally erect but devoid of sensation. <laughs> well, whatever, it's a phenomenal image. What about the statue, eh? Well, it's different. One of the major flaws the statue has is the softness of detail. It's evident all over, and it plays a major role in how these figures present themselves. There's very little of the ambiguity of sensation, you know, the intense, paralysed writhing that Bisley's figures have. They look instead as if they're gently slipping into a state of repose. They're still transforming, though. All humanity and identity seems to be eroding away until there's nothing left but the featureless stone, the terrain of Tartarus. Ah, yes, I think this is a scene of hell, of sin and punishment. Now, I can certainly imagine Zeus, or whoever, introducing those who dared the forbidden to the Gorgon as punishment for their transgressions. After all, where did Milton place Medusa in Paradise Lost? Right next to the waters of Tantalus. In Bisley's image, the transgressions of these fellows is implicitly sexual. It's a huge part of the image. But because the figures around Medusa on the statue aren't anywhere near as evocative, it loses a great deal of that strength. The symbolic power of the head is still made sexual via Medusa's body, but because these figures cannot really reflect the sexual theme, it winds up going nowhere. Without this reflection, this Medusa becomes a general sexy Medusa, and the figures can no longer embody sexual transgression, or defiance, or deviancy, or daring, but instead become avatars of more generalised ideas of succumbing to forbidden temptation. It still fits, mind you, it's all right, but the precise meaning of Bisley's image is tragically undermined. That is, if you only think of this as an adaptation. Which brings me to my ultimate theory about this statue. It's not an adaptation at all. It's a sequel, and more than that, it's the third part of a trilogy. I can't help but compare Bisley's picture, and by extension the statue, to a painting completed in 1984 by the legendary Boris Vallejo. The similarities are immediate and striking in terms of premise, theme, setting, and they even share identical erectile symbolism. But the differences are what really counts, though. Look at those masculine figures for a start, rendered with typical Vallejo idealism. Look at the muscularity! They're not cowering or recoiling from the Gorgon, not really. Not even this one, I think. But instead, they are presenting themselves with all pride and confidence and, you might even say, casual transgressors' arrogance, daring to do the forbidden. And what about Medusa? Well, she's turned away from us. And this is great. This builds tension and anticipation. At any moment, she could turn and we could be confronted with the Gorgon's head, the ultimate taboo. Taken alone, the painting preserves this sense of imminence, stretches it out potentially forever. Well, that said, if you consider this picture, Bisley's fine image, and the statue in the context of a sequence, as I happen to do one afternoon, certain lines of continuity become evident. Here is our starting point, anticipation. 
The central male figure, who may be Atlas, is experiencing now what will soon happen to us. We are on the edge of an experience that we have up till this point only imagined, but we choose to look. The ordinary sky up there of the world that we understand is receding, and the pillars are looming out of the dark. What comes next? What's well, very sudden? Our moment of revelation is upon us, the sudden climax. Posing and posturing is done. Involuntary tension takes over. The pillar is singular and engorged. It's a shared experience we're having here in this strange darkness. Our choice to look has carried us to the underworld. And then it's just over. The mystique is spent. The pillar is withered. Medusa is looking away as we got what we came for. Maybe she's already forgotten us and why not? Did we think that we would be any exception to the rule of the Gorgon? That we would be any different to those men back there who were already wasting away? And in truth, so are we. The details are blurred, our vision is fading, and oblivion beckons. Even if we live, we are forever changed. That is the price you pay to know the unknowable and experience the Gorgon. We haven't really paid, of course. These are only images, and the experience, just imagined. A vicarious experience, at best. But the lesson is real. It's the same apotropaic lesson that Medusa always seems to bring, and I think Rossetti expressed it very well. Let not thine eyes know any forbidden thing itself, although it once should save, as well as kill, but be its shadow upon life enough for thee. Rats that look like men? <laughs>